1991. It's like snowy out. There used to be a bunch of uh, burned up sports cars out here and things like that. And so me as a 12 year old was just obsessed with that. And so I used to ride down the tracks this way. So we see a pickup truck in the distance and it come, comes closer and we're just like, ah, uh, I don't know who this is. You know, we're, probably, we're not supposed to be back here anyway. And then all of a sudden, pop, 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 we hear these pops. And so I start running that way. My group of friends start running that way. And you keep hearing these pops. Where were you exactly when the shots rung out? Do you know? Like right, a little bit right over here. How far away is the truck? Pretty far, like probably half of a block. We ran this way and uh, it, this is a lot more treacherous at the time. There's like a lot, I, these plants weren't quite as high. There's a lot of garbage everywhere. You're constantly running and into where things. are the cars exactly? All over the place. Like it almost seemed like people would like burn up a car and leave it here as an insurance scam or something. The scar is like a slice and then you could see the actual bullet hole. So like slice the skin a little bit and then went in. It was a 22. Felt like a hot pocket was just <laughs> on my <laughs> on my leg and I can't. Was it because hot pockets are somewhat large compared to a bullet hole. Did <laughs> yes. it really like, did, yeah. did the heat like cover that much of your leg? Yeah, yeah. It literally felt like my leg was just warm and I was just running. And you know, and this is like one of those things where like this probably took a total of 10 seconds. But like in my head, it's like this 10 minute long like thing where I'm like, my leg is starting to get warm. Actually, it's uncomfortably warm. Wow, it's hot now. Oh, it feels like a cigar is poking into my leg. And by the time I reached in, it just went perfectly through the hole in like my snow pants and into the bullet hole. Like my finger just went boop, right in there. And then, you know, it took a minute to realize what was happening. Like I was like, I have a bullet in my leg. And then immediately my body just gives out. I fall on the ground. You scream into the snow. What do your friends do? They're just they escaping. They are gone. They go over that fence. They, the bikes are on the opposite side of the fence. At the time, I was I was upset that they had left, but I completely understand when children run away from another child that had just been shot. And then I managed to hop over the fence in like, you know, in a shaking panic. And then by the time I got on my bike, I was angry. The adrenaline gland just kicked in. I didn't feel anything. I, I don't think I felt anything. I kind of didn't care as much. I was just like, ah, I'm, go I'm gonna go to the hospital. I'm gonna get this sewn up and then I'm, I'm gonna get them back, you know, which never happened. But the bullet time. was in there, so it wasn't through and through. Yeah, they pulled the bullet out. A few weeks ago, a story dominated my newsfeed. Researchers at University of Chicago have used AI to repeatedly and reliably predict crime with a 90% accuracy within a range of about a thousand feet. Now, I know that headlines like this typically contain hyperbole, but this paper actually checks out. I felt like my particular journey and perspective might be good at helping my viewers make sense of all this, or so I hoped. To a lot of people, AI prediction seems pretty scary, but it's virtually everywhere, and chances are that if you woke up tomorrow and it was gone, you'd probably be annoyed by the inconvenience. For example, some of you might pick up your phone and open up your app menu around dinner time and notice that Uber Eats is in your recommended apps. Smart thermostats can look at weather data and learn from our behaviors and predict what temperatures will make us comfortable throughout the day while increasing energy efficiency. And oddly, nobody seems creeped out that Google literally finishes our sentences when we search something. What might surprise you is that AI crime prediction is actually nothing new. In fact, it's been pretty problematic in the past. AI bias is not all that different than human bias. As I'm sure you already know, in a lot of cities, lower income areas are often coupled with higher crime rates. And if an algorithm tells a police officer to go to a specific neighborhood with a heightened expectation of finding crime, guess what happens? They find crime, but they find crime disproportionately. Someone might be abusing their spouse in public in a rich neighborhood while all of the police are spending their time finding people for broken taillights in a poor neighborhood. It's just biased policing with a much higher price tag. What makes this particular algorithm different is that it attempts to avoid this bias by creating a model of much smaller tiles that can avoid traditional or political boundaries, which might make things a bit less generalized and therefore less prone to bias. Full transparency? I'm not yet sold on it, which is why I wanted to meet some of the algorithm's architects to try and understand it better.
You're a real sack of Orwellian shit. I hope the jackbooted thugs to which you're providing this crime forecast AI never turn it on anyone you hold dear. You're, quite simply, a vile, oppression-enabling worm. This person has good grammar. Let's put it that way. For what? For like the lunacy of what they're saying? It is, it's kind of a haiku of, of vileness. In a perfect world, like where would this end up? Crime data is kind of complicated because you're, you're never measuring the crime itself. It's like through police yeah. uh, response, you're measuring that, reported crime. So there's always that factor that we're not really looking at actual crime. There are all these things like people having the confidence of people and calling the authorities, all that factors in. So ideally, maybe we can go towards where we can actually get a handle of what the actual dynamics is and help people optimize what kind of interventions, decisions needs to be taken to reduce crime. The ultimate way to predict a crime is to just talk to people who might commit those crimes. Are you angry? Are you in a gang? Are you, are you, do you have some sort of reason to commit this crime? Do you have access to a weapon? Do you have a weapon? You know, things like that. To be absurd, you know, the ultimate way to predict crime is to produce crime. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, yeah. which is, you know, like uh, to commit crime. And I, I think what's interesting about that and non-trivial is this has been, uh, you know, one aspect of criticism about crime enforcement, you know, in general. Like we can make crime very predictable by squeezing it into certain parts of the city, sure. <laughs> into certain subpopulations, into certain regions, and they're not entirely wrong, as yeah. we show basically from our analysis. So, so no criminal records, essentially? No. Okay. It's all really public data. Okay. All the cities that we have looked at, it's all public data. When I look at this whole, this whole situation, the salesman is the problem. Are you worried, is, is, there, is there any possibility that for-profit company would try to sell this to a community and then you would have you know, somebody, a cop, seeing it as probable cause? We were using this to basically identify biased enforcement. Yeah. And there's substantial biased enforcement. I mean, this is, you know, how, you know, I'm not saying how it is that they allocate, how they're thinking about allocating police officers, but systematically, when crime goes up, then they draw them to high resource areas. Yeah. You know, and so I think our, our, our hope, you know, how is it this, this could be used, there are many ways it could be used, but our hope is that um, we can basically build um, or begin to build a base where people who are, you know, citizens are surveilling. I mean, this, you know, public data resources allow us to surveil the surveillance, you know, in ways that allow us to hold them accountable in ways that were previously impossible. So if you had one message for just a general media writer who wants the clickbait of a 90% crime prediction, minority yeah, report, yeah, etc. Yeah. What would you tell, what do you want to So recently, I mean, uh, Maybe in the last couple of weeks or two or three weeks, uh, a few articles have come out which are kind of uh, framing this as some kind of conspiracy theory. Like they are pushing this so that they can, they can get more control and they're rolling this out. I mean, who are this they? <laughs> It's us! Oh my gosh! The they is us. Do the man! <laughs> no, no, no. There, there is no conspiracy going on. I mean, does, the academic world doesn't work like that. Even the funding world in general doesn't work like that. Uh, yeah, there are concerns of this kind of predictive technologies. Uh, we have to be aware of being used incorrectly or wrongly. And that's, that's a legitimate concern. Yeah. But getting off the rails and kind of going into this conspiracy, how are people reading our minds? The University of Chicago is ironically a 15 minute drive from some of the neighborhoods suffering the worst from violent crime. And just south of Englewood, less than three miles from where I was shot, is St. Sabina, a Catholic parish led by Pastor Michael Flager. And Michael is not at all what you would expect from a Catholic priest. We don't take cars away by putting titles on them. Why can't we do that with guns and every gun in America? So if somebody who's buying 200 guns, selling them on the streets, if they can't transfer those titles, then they're gonna be held responsible for the guns that they sell. In the Constitution, black folks were three-fifths 
of a human being. My Catholic service growing up was in Latin. So it was like, oh, you know, oh the non this niece, and oh. it was like that, it's just like. I reached out to Pastor Flager, and he put me in touch with Purpose Over Pain, a nonprofit founded by a group of parents who lost their children to gun violence. They predict violent crime in their own way. They talk to people. They talk to gang members and find out what they're angry about. They find out if they have access to firearms. They do their best to offer help to people in need, whether it be crisis counseling or access to mental health care. Their organization is a role model of what effective community policing should be. You know, they get paid to do different researches on, on our community, and uh, then they always come in and be like, we'll give you $50 of this and that, and we never hear the outcome. But, but then I say, I'm, you know, for my young people, my young kids, I'm not letting them do it anymore because now I feel like they exhibit, you, you know? know, so, and then, you know, so I, I don't know, I just, I just, I, you know, it's a little frustrating with that. Yeah. People just research and just research. Then, then you go to these, these events and that's all you see is numbers. But we see it, when we talk to people, we see people see like our kids that's buried in the ground. So I'm like, I don't need a number. Yeah. I need some type of plan and I'm not knocking anything. We need something done to, to make this stop, but um, uh, you can't just keep giving me data. I mean, you got you to gotta show me some action. We down on the grounds, we working every day. Mm -hmm. We in and out of these communities um, doing a lot and, and we on the grounds working. So, yeah. uh, and, and people in these communities don't want to hear numbers, they want to see action. Since I moved to Georgia, one thing that I consistently hear is people saying, uh, well, isn't it funny that Chicago has the strictest gun laws yet mm -hmm. has the highest, you know, and my thinking Tomorrow, I'm gonna go across the border and try and buy a gun in Indiana mm -hmm. to see how hard it is. Uh, how do you think that's gonna go? It, it's gonna go easy. Um, <laughs> not only that, you don't even have to go to Indiana. You can go to, to outside of Chicago, just to Riverdale. Really? So, Riverdale to Chucks, we have strict laws in the city of Chicago, but you can go a couple blocks over and you can get, get the guns. One gun bill we asked for was one gun a month. Hmm. Um, I mean, that, so the, the fact and that, that, that wasn't even, that was a common sense. <laughs> Why would you need 12 guns? I need 12 right. guns, even yeah. from a collector. Right. So then if my household, me and my husband want to buy one, that's 24 guns. That's two guns a month. It's illegal mm -hmm. guns that's mm -hmm. flooding our community. So you have more guns than you have books. People say, well, illegal guns, you know, that has nothing to do with us because we own legal guns. And it's like, well, they, they were all legal at one point. It's exactly. not like people they are building guns exactly. in their garages. Exactly. And if you had the power to, to make this decision, would you rather see an in increased or decreased police presence? Decrease. Yeah. To some of my viewers, there's narrative missing here. I imagine a lot of people don't understand the logic of crime victims wishing they'd have less police. That's because most statistics about the effectiveness of policing come from police. In fact, the most broad independent study on this will tell you that it takes an average of 17 full-time police officers to reduce the average city's homicide rate by one. A tiny fraction of that money can save more lives by simply increasing the capacity of a shelter or funding a rehabilitation program. If you don't feel like reading exhaustive sociology studies, then you could just use common sense. If police spending directly decreased crime, then America would be the safest country in the world, not a spectacle of out-of-control gun violence. A great example of why these neighborhoods are at odds with police can be exhibited in the first documentary-style YouTube video I ever made, long before I started this particular channel. It was initially a video to help a small charity on my block raise money so they could continue giving children something to do and keep them away from gangs and off the streets. That evening, while editing the video, the Chicago police broke in to their building and stole all of the money that they had raised on their street sale. Oh, oh, I know, this sounds f***ing insane, but luckily I was able to leave my camera recording long enough so that the cops could incriminate themselves. All right, what about my money then, so That's what you dealt with inside the house. Turn this thing off, man. Okay, I'm leaving. Not that it made any difference or was even out of the ordinary, but now you might understand why a lot of people in South Chicago want less police. It occurred to me that it's probably very easy to blame a disconnect between researchers and victims on the researchers because of their privilege. But it's an important reminder that Ashanu and James are not community organizers. They're not paid to reduce gun violence. They're scientists who are excellent at gathering and finding new purposes in data. And one of their data sets happens to be violent crime. And it appears like they're trailblazing and leading this area of technology. They've created an incredibly scalable tool 
it's just not up to them how it's used. The researchers unilaterally want this to be open data, and Pamela repeatedly mentioned that her community is exhaustively part of other types of sociological research, but none of the researchers ever share their data with those equipped to make use of it. That's difficult to hear, and also not surprising. Reducing people to numbers that become packaged as intellectual property is incredibly dehumanizing. And it's unfortunately how a lot of psychological, sociological, and economic research exists. But again, literally every single person in this video wants this research to end up as open data. It's still unclear to me how one can make that happen, though. Another thing that was unclear to me was Indiana's gun laws. Some sources said that I could buy anything that I wanted. Others said that I couldn't buy a handgun living out of state. I decided to just stay a little bit longer and find out. I feel like I'm going to Disneyland or something. Wow. Wowee. All right, so quick rundown of what I did back there. I picked out like the cheapest handgun that they had and then passed a background check using my passport card not my driver's license. So it didn't have my address on it, but I assume that they were able to verify that through the background check, because I did have to enter my address on the computer when doing the background check. But I really don't want a handgun, and I don't want to pay money to put another one on the streets. So I changed my mind, and I looked at the assault rifles. I asked if there was a mag limit. There is not, so I could have gotten a nice semi-automatic assault rifle with a scope and a laser and an extended mag with absolutely no restrictions. I could have showed them an Illinois driver's license saying that I live just down the road on the south side of Chicago and they would have sold me that assault rifle with the extended mag. So I chose a pretty classic looking cowboy rifle that shoots the same caliber bullet that entered my leg when I was 12 years old. So it's a nice ending, right? With open data being such a driving narrative here, the last time Chicago published a gun trace report was 2017. And sure enough, even then, the exact Cabela's I visited was directly supplying guns used in violent crimes in Chicago. Not that I needed a report to tell me this since half of the cars in the parking lot had Illinois plates. In fact, in the very brief time I was there to buy a gun, I saw people video chatting with their phone to select a handgun before making the purchase. Cabela's has actually been sued for their lack of vigilance regarding the few existing gun laws they do have to follow, so you'd think at the very least they'd have a no literally using FaceTime to be a surrogate for someone who can't own a gun policy. But hey, you would also think that a gun a month per individual would be a completely acceptable limit. You'd think that magazine sizes mirroring what our armed forces typically use would be a no-brainer. But no, instead you have irrefutable data showing that just a dozen stores in the Chicagoland area are supplying Chicago with thousands upon thousands of illegally obtained guns in the last decade. There have been over 12,000 crime guns recovered in Chicago in 2021 alone. So there's actually an incredibly simple solution to this horrific problem. It's just that nobody who has the power to enact it gives a shit. I say this because last year, more children were victims of gun violence in Chicago than died of COVID in all of America. In fact, as an example of proving how little of a shit is given, I tried to find out how many children were shot in Chicago in the period of time that Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie were dominating the media last year. The number of children murdered by guns in Chicago in that brief two-month period is 23. The total number of gun deaths in Chicago last year in 2021 is 854. There are a lot of complex problems in Chicago, but the most obvious and glaring one is that children are heavily armed and killing one another to the point where we are reducing them to a constantly growing number of dead bodies. And we know exactly where their guns are coming from and we know exactly who is profiting from it. The puzzle has been solved decades ago. So you tell me, what the f is the point of broadly predicting crime when nobody in our federal government will do anything to stop it? Well, as depressing as it is to have a solution that we have to avoid because some politicians require 
the votes of irresponsible gun owners, there might be something we could do. <laughs> so let's just say this video inspires somebody who can pull some strings and the University of Chicago gets that crime prediction algorithm running again and maybe even tweaks it to have more localized clusters. And instead of trying to get law enforcement to pay attention, we could give this stream of data to Michael Flager or Purpose Over Pain as they can look at one of these squares and likely know what gang or even individuals are there. After all, they're already out there on the street doing this and a heat map might be able to just provide them with a hint to where they could better provide de-escalation services. And if that worked, even just a little bit, you would be creating hard evidence that tax dollars can go much farther working with communities than they can by simply hiring more police. So what do you say, person who's in charge of an endowment fund? You get to be a hero. If you're one of my subscribers or my returning viewers, I apologize for just throwing some emotionally exhausting content in your face, but I'm sure you could probably agree that it's for good reason. Since this dips its toes in a political issue, part of me thinks that the comment section might be a dumpster fire. If you say anything disrespectful about any of the people in the video, you're gonna get blocked from engaging with my channel. Of course, I imagine that I'll be losing some viewers or subs. It is what it is. It doesn't make anything in this video less true. I'm gonna move over here so I could list some credits. I really want to thank my Patreon members. They are the endowment fund that helps make videos like this possible, and it could not be done without them. At the very least, I would have had to make the video while shilling a VPN or something, which, you know, probably would have screwed up the flow of the whole thing. And while my Patreon and Discord is an incredible community, I'm going to ask that if you want to spend money at the end of this video, you spend it on purpose over pain, because they are a nonprofit that is actually making a real difference.